Hi, Dr. Wolf. Uh, my name is Connor, and I'm a member of Platypus 10. Uh, in your introduction, you praise social democratic parties in Europe for their recent electoral successes. However, in your first rebuttal, you praise China's steep economic growth, a country very different than European social democracies. My question is, should socialists support any quote-unquote socialist country that has positive economic growth, or are there distinct political goals that a socialist movement should aim to achieve? Thank you. Anyone who spends time thinking about different societies and who's a reasonable human being will come up with a number of indices. It would be a, a strange to have one or even two. It would be like going to a doctor who simply takes your temperature, tells you you're fine because it's 98.6 and sends you home. You know you need a new doctor. You need someone who uses a variety of measures and a variety of indices. So of course, socialists of all different kinds use a variety of indices. But if you want to talk, as apparently some of us do, about individual freedom, then ask yourself what, how it helped your freedom to have to go into debt to get a college degree, a debt that you will carry for the rest of your life. What a crazy capitalism that puts your income and the cost of an education in such a relationship that you have to go into lifelong debt and we know what it's costing. Of course, you can blame the government because we have a theory here that blames everything that's unfortunate about capitalism on the government so that the capitalism can still escape the responsibility that it ought to have. Social democracy in yeah. Europe has one index China has a different. I'm not sure it makes much sense to apply the standards of one to the other, but both of them have gone a long way in changing the conditions of the capitalism they inherited. Thank you. It is truly amusing to hear uh, student debt blamed on capitalism. You know, there are three prices in the U.S. economy that have gone up nonstop. Uh, education, housing, and health care. All student debt. Who do you owe the student debt to, by the way? Who do you get the student debt from? Banks? Private banks? Is there a private sector involved? No. 100% of student debt today is to the government. If you forget Obama basically nationalized the whole student debt, you are paying your student debt, the interest payments to the government. Uh, Health care. Health care in the United States is close to 60%. Government run. Uh, 60 cents of every dollar is spent by the government on health care. And finally, housing, well, we all know uh, the degree to which local governments, in this case, control the supply of housing and create an artificial, uh, artificial uh, shortages. So every other price in the economy, almost every other price in the economy, is declining, particularly in those areas where the government has had relatively hands-off, like technology. Prices are plummeting. It's only in the areas where the government is hands-on, aggressively hands-on, where prices only go up. Markets reduce prices, increase quality. Always. Hi, uh, just a quick note um, for the speakers. Uh, do you mind cutting you off for any questions? Feel free to stand on and give as much as you see as you can. Stand on the mic. Yes. Oh. Hi, so this question is for Dr. Brooke. Um, Freedom and success have been major uh, points in this debate, and I'm sure we'd all agree that happiness is, you know, integral to those two ideas, freedom and success. So considering that, how would you explain that uh, compared to other social democratic countries, I won't call them socialists, but countries that adopt more socialist policies like France, Sweden, Norway, Finland, uh, the United States uh, has higher mental illness rates uh, overall lower quality of life by pretty much all, uh, all metrics, um, and lower health outcomes. How would you explain that? I, first of all, I dispute all of those statistics. It's just not true. Uh, it, it, you know, the French, certainly the French, uh, they live in smaller houses, they have smaller cars, have smaller lives than Americans do. They make a lot less money. They have a lot less wealth. And when, uh, when uh, you are sick and you have a little bit of money, you don't go to France to get treated. You get on a plane and you come to Mayo Clinic. 
which is what Berlusconi and pretty much any political leader in Europe does when they get sick. They don't go to France. They don't go even to Germany, which is significantly better health care than France. Is. But look, I'm not here to defend the American system. The American system, as I said originally, is no good. The American system is way too socialist. It's way too, has way too much government involvement in it. We would be much happier, much richer, much wealthier. We'd have a thousand times better health care if it was privatized. If it was actually, if the government got out of the business of health care and actually allowed. Do you know the, the little bit of private sector health care that we have in the United States today provides 70% of all the innovations around the world. Um, it provides almost all in, in every aspect of health care. I think the statistics uh, brought forward by the young lady are spot on. I have no idea what my adversary here is talking about. The United States spends a larger share of its GDP on health care than any other of the countries in Europe by a wide margin, even though they have a greater degree of state support for health insurance for everybody from birth uh, to death. Uh, and let me assure you, if you ever want to look at a statistic that might interest you, my family is French, so you'll understand my response. Uh, the number of Americans who go to France to enjoy the quality of life there dwarfs by an order of magnitude the reverse flow. And you might think about why that is. So this is a question for Dr. Wolf. Uh, many socialist countries are extremely homogenous. Uh, how do you imagine your idea of socialism would work to any degree in America with many different races and ideologies? And if it is always just true majoritarianism, uh, is the system always destined to fail because of the oppression of the minority? Well, you know, many of the countries that have made experiments in socialism have not been whatever exactly you might mean by homogeneous. They've had to deal with all kinds of ethnic, religious, regional minorities. Uh, if you remember, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics called itself that odd name because it was, in fact, a collection of very different people, very different different nations, with different religions, with different ethnic and value systems, and so on. And they had a struggle all through their lives about how to deal uh, with that kind of a situation. No, socialism is not some panacea that solves all problems. That's a caricature. It's not serious. Socialism, it's a little bit like slavery. You get rid of slavery because it's valuable to make people free. You don't imagine that with slavery gone, all of our other problems have disappeared. It's the same with capitalism. We got to get rid of a system that organizes itself for the control by a very small minority of employers who have absurd power over the mass of the majority which have to be sustained in that unequal situation by being endlessly regaled with stories about their individual choices, which of course they can't make because of the structure of the system that constrains Thank them. You. That's the issue. I mean, the, the idea that because in America we have employees, therefore they have no choices is bizarre. All you have to go is walk into a grocery store in the United States and see the amount of choices that you have. And if anybody ever, ever went into a grocery store in, uh, in uh, the Soviet Union, you would know the difference in the kind of choices that you have, not just material choices, but the spiritual choices of the kind of music you want to listen to, the kind of art you want to experience, the kind of experiences you want to have, the array of choices that we have with just a little bit of capitalism in the United States is stunning as compared to any socialist experiment that has ever existed. And this idea that American working class is somehow suffering and, and burdened and in misery is ridiculous. 
Um, the working class in America are some of the richest people in the world. Uh, in terms of per capita income or wealth, uh, we have been an enormous success across the board. Yes, inequality is high, but that's part of that is that the people at the bottom are much richer than they used to be, much richer than people in the middle class or upper classes in other countries. Yes, if we're all equally poor, it looks like we have inequality, but now the inequality is in a space where we're all relatively rich. Wow, wow. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com slash support. I'll go to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content, and of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.